All right, so last we have David Taylor. David Taylor is an assistant professor of sustainability at Stony Brook University. His writing crosses disciplinary boundaries and genres. However, at the, corner, at the core of his work always is the concern for sustainability and community. One of his current projects is The People's Art and Modernism, Woody Guthrie, Joseph Campbell, and Miguelito Valdez in New York in the 1940s. Woody Guthrie's writing and music, Joseph Campbell's interest in an ecology of folk mythologies, and the rise of popular Latin, especially Afro-Cuban music, for example, by Miguelito Valdez, function as windows into a time and place that allow diverse interactions and legacies in the arts that still resonate today. Please welcome David Taylor. Uh, thank you again, uh, Malvern Books. Bryce, thank you. And Palmer. <laughs> uh, actually, yeah, um, I, uh, we were just talking about Palmer the other day and what an important legacy to offer to San Antonio. It's really important. Um, so, y'all can tell I'm a Texan, not a New Yorker. And uh, so, uh, when uh, the new book that Bryce published came out in September, I had a chance uh, to come down and do about five days of readings. So I flew down on Thursday, and I was so happy to get out of New York where it's cold, and I landed in Austin in a snowstorm. <laughs> and you brought it to the <laughs> oh, I was taking pictures, sending it back to my friends up there going, well, I can't use those words. But I was like, not good. And then, so Friday morning I got up and I drove to Lockhart and Luling to find barbecue because, well, you know, that made me happy. Then San Antonio, and then I was in Shriner, uh, the other day in uh, San Marcos last night. So uh, I appreciate all of this. It's been a lot of fun. I'm a little sad about going back, but that's all right. Uh, in light of this, I wanted to read the first poem uh, from the first book that uh, Palmer published years ago. And I'm sure some of you all know this. Um, how do you know when you come across a good cattle tank with some good catfish in it? What are you going to find on the fence post? A skull. Right. So back when, this is something, especially my, my parents are all from West Texas, from Stanford and uh, Looters and that area, is my dad would always say, hey, look here, son, there's some good catfish, look at them heads on the fence post. So this one is about catfish heads on the fence post. Um, um, it's called Texas River Song. There's an old traditional uh, cowboy tune, kind of Texas tune, called Texas River Song that ends with, oh, the Trinity's muddy and the brass is quick sand. Um, and so I, I kind of use that um, and do this. So it's called Texas River Song. Low lurch and soft drift, tan reflection of post oak, sumac, willow, Johnson grass. Swirls of catfish draw and push up the mud and boiling like thick tea water. And the breath of heavy water stands still and you uh, excuse me, stand and feel your covered feet sink in the soft silk bed. Red clay, warm water, muscle push, balancing, curled toes. When you see the catfish heads nailed on a post or hanging from a tree, dry, open mouth, raisin eyes, run one finger along the forehead, feel the dried skin, one sweat with the trinity. Trace a line from mouth to gill. Heavy mud breathed and expired. Sluggish fancies. Slumbering daydreams. And a slow roar of the river in your ears. So, uh, this one was actually as a kind of a moving around. I, I, I want to read you one odd poem if it's okay. Uh, does anyone know the name Katie Lee? Arizona kind of writer figure. She was uh, very famous in um, uh, Colorado River Preservation. She was paddling the river back in the 50s, Frank Waters and others. Uh, she, before then, she was actually a folk musician in uh, Hollywood in the 30s and actually was uh, very close friends with her lives. Um, and Katie, after they built the uh, dam at Powell, uh, she wanted nothing more than to blow it up her entire life. Uh, and Katie was very outspoken about this. Uh, Katie was, when I met her, she was in her 80s. 
and her favorite thing was still to ride her mountain bike through Jerome, Arizona, uh, naked. Um, and she didn't mind, and she was just a very, she was a colorful figure, to say the least. Um, but um, when I had been out in Arizona for a while, I came back and I had this uh, job for a short time just to make any money at a Pier 1. And they were playing Burl Lives music over and over, right? And it's like, it starts to beat you down. But Kenny had told me this story. <laughs> Kenny told me this story when she was this younger woman in, L in, in, you know, in LA, in Hollywood, and she's trying to make it. And Burl was always hitting on her. And she's like, Burl, no, it ain't going to happen. No, it's not going to happen. And finally, he goes, okay, okay. He goes, go out with to, with, to dinner with me one more time. So she finally says yes, because you know, he wasn't you know, creepy or anything. But she gets there, and he's got this gift. And he goes, well, I want you to have this. So she opens it, and there's a box, and there's another box, and there's another box. And finally, gets down to this little bitty box. And in the last little box, there's a note that just says, never take away a man's anticipation. Sometimes that's all we got. <laughs> so, uh, Kitty passed away actually about two weeks ago. It was really sad because she was kind of one of the old characters of Arizona. Uh, she was in her late 90s and mountain biked until she was in about 96. Wow. Uh, and she was just a funny old gal. So this one is called When Burl Ives Comes a Call. <laughs> Um, for Katie Lee, kiss her once for me. Uh, Burl Ives have a holly jolly Christmas. Burl Ives' voice comes on every 44 minutes over the store speakers, hawking Christmas wares. Have a holly jolly Christmas. I've never separated his voice from the holidays, Dr. Seuss stories, things playful. But now, a 40-year-old man, hearing his voice this way tires me. This evening, minding a beer in a uh, small fire in my backyard, watching the dog chase morning dove, pushed here by the last cold front. I got your Christmas card, Katie. Three colors of ink. You wrote, off to Baja for a month, and even a picture of the rock by the Sea of Cortez. I remember the story. Earl tried to seduce you, a gift within a gift, and a note about the importance of anticipation. The horny old bastard. You called him laughing, who was so lovely and so kind. The evening I met you, the most beautiful 80-year-old I've ever seen, talking of the lives of rivers the and writing, Glen Canyon, that fucker Floyd Dominey, because she always used that word right before Floyd Dominey, who was responsible for building the dam. You asked me to stretch out my legs on the couch across your lap, draped your hands across them, and you winked. Katie, you are a flirt and alive. And even as the store, the store speakers and all the shopping robs Burl's voice, your whole being resurrects it and reminds me of when I was young, aware and conscious of my body, wild in its muscle and edge, like the shape of canyons beneath water. So. Yeah, she's a funny old gal. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so inappropriate. I've never heard the word F. I've never heard that many F bombs thrown out all the time. Um, one, of the, one of the first things that Bryce published, which I think has still got to be one of the weirder collections of poetry, um, in 1940, John Steinbeck had uh, become very popular because of Grapes of Wrath. And uh, so all of these people were coming to Monterey to hang out with him and drink beer and everything. Um, but long before then, um, Steinbeck had befriended a local biologist, a guy named Ed Ricketts, who was a pretty well-known intertidal biologist. Uh, what's interesting to know, too, is, is in 1932, way back when, Joseph Campbell was rethinking his life and also moved to Monterey. And Campbell and Steinbeck and Ricketts were all hanging out and drinking and getting into trouble, as one could do back then. Um, Ricketts took Campbell on a trip through the Northwest Passage in uh, 1932. By 1940, Steinbeck was relatively wealthy. He was really tired of people coming uh, to uh, Monterey. So he funded a trip through the Sea of Cortez. And it was uh, an extraordinary six-week trip. Actually, in February, I'm getting to go to the, to the Sea of Cortez and reenact part of it for a week. I'm pretty excited about that. But, um, 
during the six week trip, it was really interesting. They had their crew with them. They collected all along the interior of the Sea of Cortez. They came back and they put together a book. And, and the book is mostly, if you look at it now, most of it's taxonomy. So it's about, I don't know, I think it's like six or 700 pages. It's massive. And unless you really like taxonomy and intertidal species, there's not a lot going on. Except Steinbeck <laughs> took Ricketts notes from the trip and put them into a narrative that opens the book. And actually, so years ago when I was at North Texas, one of my uh, environmental scientist friends wanted me to read the book. And so I read the narrative and I became so intrigued because Steinbeck and Ricketts were constantly trying to find ways to link the humanities and the sciences. And really talking a lot like we were talking earlier about field biology, about this way of thinking that teaches you how things work in an ecological way. Uh, so the, uh, as was talked about earlier, much of the project that I'm doing about New York in the 1940s is based on Ricketts' influence on people like Steinbeck and Campbell and how this influenced much of the culture of, of arts in 1940s New York and Manhattan. So anyway, I got so excited about the book, I decided to write a book of poetry about the book. Now, I would tell you before you read this book, go read the narrative first. It's probably going to make this movie a little bit better. But I, I was, it really struck me. So one of the things I did in this little chapbook was have these sections sort of reflecting on what the trip meant. So there's one moment where it's toward the end of the whole trip and they're, they're constantly bending over, looking down, the tide's out, they're picking up species and trying to you know, collect them and make sure they're doing it. But they've noticed that sometimes they've spent so much time collecting that they've lost um, like their ability to see other things around them that they've so focused on collecting, and they've so focused on particular kinds of collections that they've started ignoring everything else around them. So there's this kind of important line where it says, it is advisable to look from the tide pools to the stars and back to the tide pools again. And I remember that really struck me because Thoreau in his last essay, Autumnal Tense, has this moment where he says, the problem is if you hang out with people who like grasses, they ignores the trees. And if you have people who like the trees, they ignore the grasses. And he goes, what it really requires is, and Thoreau uses this line, different intentions of the eye. And I would say in the same way, we were talking about this earlier, that I think the problem uh, in much of education now is we've so specialized things, we've forgotten how to encourage students to be diverse and to think very broadly and to switch in between the tide pools and the stars and that they can be good scientists while writing poetry, and they can be good poets while doing good science. And that's the one I, I, I constantly am pushing my students to get rid of, because I think that's part of the reason we're in a little bit of the fix we are now. Uh, so let me read this one called Touch From the Tide Pools to the Stars. We've done our best to collect, and yes, we've killed a lot all along this trip. We've taken life to eat, We've taken life to name. We've robbed the tide pools of as much as we could hold and stabbed at a mantle with a rusty harpoon we bought from a native. Watched the horned shark die on the deck of the boat for 17 hours, not moving, blood pooling on its skin and its goat slit eyes, staring and staring until the deck made tiny, could watch no more for fear of his soul. We've eaten yellowfin raw it turns sweet in our mouths. We've tossed around crude words and stories, dressed down to our convenience as we walk through the ciudades muy tranquila. But our eyes linger on the people there behind the doors of their grandmothers. For all of our earthly ways, we've had times too that stilled us as we shifted our eyes from tide pool to star and back again. We knew then we were collecting ourselves, naming and renaming, rethinking our roots and limbs, calling each other newly by the names we've always used. We began to know each other, and knowing is also not knowing, always a beginning to how we are connected. The something that Jesus and Darwin had in common, living in the same old house, taking collection notes as prayer. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, that makes my 
fundamentally that Baptist family happy when I say things like that. <laughs> Except for that Marvel part. Oh, they don't like that part. But. Um, so this one uh, that just came out in September uh, this called um, Calm Up, Calm Down. One of my favorite things that Bryce did that made me very happy is his poetry. And then it has this, and it says environmental literature. And that makes me really freaking happy, by the way. Uh, I like I like being a poet. And I think I'm you know I'm okay at it. I think there are folks who are farther along in that path than I. Um, but when she was saying earlier that, that you know my thoughts when I write, um, I'm really very committed to the idea that I will do my scholarship to make my university happy. But I do think that um, we as writers these days have an obligation to our communities, whether it's at risk kids. Uh, whether it's uh, small presses in communities that allow us to begin to build a culture that's so important. And I don't know, I guess for me that's something that maybe for me that's the way I've always thought of what I wanted my career to be is I like being in the university, but I don't like universities that are separate from the communities that they should be a part of. And to my mind, then, the more that I can break down those walls, the happier I am. So this one um, tries to do some of that. So I'll take you through a few of these uh, and um, go from there. So the first one is, is call, uh, called The Edges of the World. <clears throat> and I was talking about this the other day. There's, there's a lot of religious sort of uh, iconography about one palm, one hand being up and one hand being down and the palm up toward the heavens and the one palm being down toward the earth. And, Actually, if you go back to Campbell, there's a lot of religious traditions that use this. Um, so for me, it was one that kind of gave me an idea of maybe something to pull this book together. So <clears throat> it's called The Edges of the World. I gave up on gods years ago, taking instead the offerings of sex, woods, and wine. Now I'm letting go of those two. Age, I guess, having looked elsewhere, and elsewhere, exhausted. I'm coming home to sit. An old verse in my ear. A small desk. A rummage stack of dog-eared books. The edges of the world. To breathe in, watching the twirling fall of brown willow leaves, the offerings of heat or cold. One hand lifted high, palm as sky. One hand palm down as earth is to make edge a center. Breathing out the edge, the, the center is shifting to edge. So, um, I have some Long Island poems, but I don't want to read those because I'm here. Um, but I will talk about this one a little bit. So, um, a few years ago, um, Penn State University has a large environmental uh, area of refuge uh, called Shavers Creek. It's about 2,000 uh, acres. And they created this program called the Long-Term Ecological Reflections Project. And what they do is, is they invite artists, writers, naturalists, uh, photographers, you name it. They invite one each uh, fall and spring. And they give you a week. And they say, go think deep thoughts or do whatever you're supposed to do. Right? And the only rules are there are eight places you have to go to. And they designate these locations that they want you to go. And they've already set up the funding so that they're going to do this for 100 years. And what they want to see is, is over these 100 years, what changes and what's similar and what stays between these folks, between naturalists and you know, artists and writers and such. What seems to be that holds this together over these years? So it's in year 10 right now. They're actually doing a book in the, in the spring. Uh, this one is the last one. So the, the various locations are things like they have actually a chestnut uh, plantation where they're trying to revive the American chestnut by <coughs> hybridizing it with Asian chestnuts and now they're genetically modifying actually some of them with wheat ge uh, genes to, in order to coat the fungus and some other things. But the last one, and this was the one that fascinated me the most, the last site is basically you've got to hike the four mile trail. That's the last place you have to go to. So I decided the last day, I was like, well, I should then hike it as many times as I can. So I got through it about five times that day. 
just hiking it nonstop, going around everything over and over and over. And I go, who is that? And I would go, Dad. Um, but I do think now, actually, more, the more I think about it, the more I'm starting to realize what I really wanted to become was a blue collar poet. Uh, and I think that's actually probably the best goal. So this is called The Work of Walking. Um, part one. I built a fire from the wood gathered from the unused fire pits and lit the fat wood that my friend Ian left me using a page of last week's USA Today's sports section. I watched the small flames of pine and hemlock, listening to Eliades Ochoa sing El Caratero, the uh, guy who pushes the cart. Yo trabajo sin reposo. I work without end. It's been wet all day. Low fog and clouds hanging just off the mountain ridge to the west. As Ochoa sings the chorus, El caballo va para el monte, the horse goes to the mountain. A light rain, more mist, then drop starts. My chair is near the fire under a pine bough, an umbrella of sorts. Off and on, a note of thunder follows, and the jays squall and cackle in the tops of the pines, throwing themselves in flurries at each other, limb to limb. Off in the distance, a downy woodpecker thumps and thumps to the sound of rain on pine needles. After the storm, the fireflies glitter, moonlit rainfall in the forest. Part two, I'm walking the four mile hike around the lake, over mowed lawn, across the rain slick wood walkways and bridges spanning Shaver's Creek, across the dam construction, up and down the trail, passing hickory, sumac, oak, hot pine, hemlock, listing in my journal as I go. What must be done? Stretching out one leg, then the other, counting shrubs and trees, noting the silver-spotted skippers by their spattered oar mark, watching a wren listening for its call, imitating perch and pitch, letting the bumblebees whirl and hum around me as I hold a stem of clover, marking a cloud shifting from one ridge to another with my hand. It's a calling to circumambulate, a vocation to circle the mountain, to round the lake, to walk the trail over and over, again, 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 beginning to see your own footsteps. Mm -hmm. So, um, there's a lot of nature stuff in this poem, which I, is good, I think I like that stuff. Um, and I also, though, I think to me again, as I was saying to someone earlier this evening, to my mind, it's, it's really hard in, in my background and in the places that I learned where my family uh, moved from West Texas. And my mom grew up on the Swinson Ranch and my dad grew up in the Looters, which you know, wasn't much. I think it's all limestone quarries now. But my parents moved to Louisville, north of uh, Dallas then, because uh, they didn't want us growing up in the country. They wanted us to be a little more city -fied. But of course, I reminded them that our high school mascot is the fighting farmers. <laughs> not, and my pets were chickens that we had to decide which one we were going to eat, uh, which makes my students appalled. But I do think, though, in some ways, you know, to my mind, uh, so much about my views on preservation you know, and notions of ecology and, and environmentalism are also deeply rooted in the notion of the cultural values that I think that are a part of that. And I don't think it's very wise to separate those. I think the more that we find our part of the community in that, both ecologically but also culturally in terms of human ideas, then I think that the more we don't separate it as we're trying to save some endangered species, but rather we're trying to save our family and our, our culture and our stories that go with this. And to my mind, that's a big part of it. So this is a somewhat long poem, and I uh, I apologize for it. It's a little it's a little on the odd side. Um, my dad was a good storyteller. Um, he uh, was a good Texas storyteller, so everything was always a lie. Uh, but they were really good lies, uh, and so it was always kind of funny. So this is called Earth Day, Texas, for my dad. In the backyard, the hen bit is wilting in early April 80 degree days. 
purple flowers turn curled yellow to brown. Above, a front of starlings spills over the neighbor's white shell, Bradford pears, the green privet leaf bundles just beginning to open in the fence row. Don't trust these city trees, my father says. The mesquites will tell you when the, first, when the last freeze is coming. Opening their feathers only when the winter is past. The closest is a mile or two away, so I've held off until I go to the country. But to the west, honey locusts, hackberry, on fence rows, mockingbirds, and cardinals dropping seeds there by the banks, box elder, sycamore, cottonwood, the faint red bud purples and service berry white in a clutch of brown trunks. And further still, red yucca, more mesquite, sage, red dust, east too, pine filtered cy cypress swamps. Dense cover, reed line, cattail thick, lake edges, white egret, blue heron, a pileated woodpecker keeping time to the passing songbirds, the steady reptiles, an orange blur of monarchs in the next few weeks. South, too, the rush of cold rivers, Pertinales, Blanco, Guadalupe, deep pools, and down through seeps, and caves, limestone cliffs, live oak, cedar, and more cedar, even ringtails, white tailed a turkey buzzard feeding on a roadside armadillo. <laughs> Only a few miles north, the muddy vein of the Red River twists and turns through a patchwork of forests and prairies. A limestone ridge here, a rise of black soil there, carrying water, the color of blood, to the beginning of the matter. In a prairie near Sanger, late afternoon, resting my left hand, there's spring flowers of blue bun and wine cup as I write. An early season red chested scissor tail treads the wind hunting grasshoppers. Above Clear Creek, buzzards circle over their rookery in the burrows. Only small pools remain in the river, not much water, the carp and gar downriver days ago. I try to write these pieces into my journal. The raccoon tracks in the creek bed, coyote scat beaded with berries, a tuft of rabbit hair on the prairie above visceral things, black soil, prairie life, Cooper's hawk, blood moon, post oaks upon post oaks, scattered dried skulls, bones of cattle, deer, red yucca sprouting black, black, excuse me, bright flowers, cockleburrs stuck in my leg hair, soft white rain lilies after a good rain, a copperhead hunting by night, drunken cowboy songs, Towns Van Zant singing high, low, and in between. Answers don't seem easy. I'm wondering if they could be. A shiner rock on a wobbly plywood table by the fire pit. In a median outside the Flying Fish restaurant in Fort Worth, a, sm a small native pecan grows, no more than 15 feet high, trunk the size of a road man's thigh, dried black quartered husks clinging to the ends of the stems. Under the detritus of candy wrappers, drink straws, and leaves, last fall's pecans idle away the winter. And somehow it seems worth it, filling the drink holder in the car with all the thumb-sized pecans it can hold. They're more shell than nut, my dad says, and he cracks three in his hand at a time. To cr excuse me, he holds three in his, in his hand at a time to crack them and carefully picks and sorts shell from nut. Five minutes for a teaspoon of pecan, he laughs, damn it, it ain't worth every second. <laughs> There's a note in what's worth noticing, a chord, a past that is presence, a place, a nod, a turn of color, a flash of wing, the uplift of rock, the sculpture of limestone fossil ammonites and sea biscuits, brown river, open sky, a canvas of wildflowers, dangling moss, perched mule ear cactus, coyote shadow, that if we listen, might be melody. Ah. So, sorry about that. One. Just, that was a little longer. Uh, so, I'll do uh, two more, one short, and another. So um, the house that I had in Denton for a long time, I got it from this uh, woman, uh, Jewel McLennan, and she had lived there for 50, 60 years. She was the sister of my uh, minister growing up. 
and uh, she was uh, pretty good. She passed away in the house, but she was a good ghost. She liked me mostly. Everything seemed to go along well. Every now and then she'd get a little annoyed and things would start to creep and make noise. But um, the house was really in disrepair. And so I was doing this thing where I was sitting in a, you know, meditation in the mornings. I'd do my incense and it'd be right by the window. And I had the Dearborn heater over here. And my daughter would come in and the incense smoke was so bad in the, in the room. And it was kind of twir twirling around because of the holes near the window and the cold air coming in. I, I remember my daughter would come in and start writing her name and her word, in other words, in the smoke with her finger. Uh, so it's like, well, I guess this is good parenting. I don't know. Uh, so this one is called Disappearing Names. Uh, the last of the winter northers came through last night. My daughter huddles by the Dearborn heater I light, as I light incense. I sit seiza, the wind softly whistling through the rotted edge, uh, window edges of the old house. The incense plume follows and curls the cool wind through the uh, living room. With her finger, she writes with her name, K-O-R-Y, in the chilly smog folk, excuse me, smoke fog. She says out loud her name. The blue air, the warm room, the smoke twirling and swirls, her disappearing name. Mm. Um, so I'll read one more, another Dearborn here, dog. This one's called Quiet Time Reading. The Dearborn heater creaks and hisses, glows and shadows, orange on the ceiling. The dog curls herself on the pillow, warming one side then the other. Though not the easiest way to read, I can, from the scattered patterns of reflected light, turn on my left side for a page and then on my right. <laughs> when I uncover, I uncover when it's too warm and then of course cover again. Steam rises from the cup of tea gum that my nightstand near the window where it is always cold, no matter how high the heater. On my nightstand, a picture of my daughter, a drawing of my dog, a pen, a deer skull, my granddad's work spurs, books, an odd creak in the house, the ghost settling in. Reading now, quiet with words, a deep breath, before the book falls. So thank you all very much.